This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidu. You are, it's Friday, April 3rd, and this is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VOA headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate you staying with us on Africa 54. The global coronavirus pandemic has reached a grim milestone, over 1 million confirmed cases. It took 76 days from January 10th for the first 500,000 COVID-19 cases to be reported. But that number doubled in the next eight days, according to Reuters. Johns Hopkins University says more than 25%, 236,000 of the cases are in the United States. The worldwide death toll stands at more than 53,000. Italy is reporting the most fatalities with more than 13,000. The World Bank has approved nearly $2 billion in funding for 25 of the world's poorest countries to battle the coronavirus pandemic. Ethiopia, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Afghanistan will get most of the first payments. The money is specifically earmarked for critical medical supplies including masks and ventilators. Meanwhile, the United Nations Food Agency says it has negotiated a humanitarian corridor to keep food aid flowing into southern Africa after many countries closed their borders to halt the spread of the coronavirus. Sierra Leone is the latest African nation to launch a fight against COVID-19 after two people with no connections tested positive in Freetown. Sierra Leone starts a three-day lockdown on Sunday. Africa has registered over 6,000 cases of the coronavirus, including more than 240 deaths, according to Reuters. Even before South Africa became the continent's most affected country by the coronavirus, the nation was already struggling with a healthcare system battered by tuberculosis and HIV. Health experts say the vulnerable population in poor and overcrowded slums is now even more at risk. Franco Puglisi reports from Johannesburg. South Africa overcrowded towns and slums suffer the most from the status of having the world's highest infection rate for tuberculosis and HIV. That means millions of poor South Africans have compromised immune systems. Health experts say the added threat from coronavirus could bring the already stretched healthcare system to its knees. If it's a community outbreak with only a few people affected and we can contain the virus, it would be fine. We would be able to, to manage. If it is unfortunately an outbreak, let's say in one of the informal settlements, the risk of people there getting seriously ill would be worse. And those are the people also that we would be uh, we, uh, that we are afraid of will have to be hospitalized and I don't think the system will be able to, to treat a huge influx of people seriously. South Africa's pharmacies are on the front line dispensing medication and trying to educate on coronavirus prevention. I think in the general communities where there's large populations I don't know how they would be able to handle it but I think I think they have made provision in the, in the larger hospitals, in the main centres. I think they have made provision. But South Africa's epidemiologists worry about the crowded slums where social distancing is almost impossible. How can the, the sick person try as much as possible to keep themselves separate from other people? For example, by even if you're sharing a room, to stay one metre from people because one metre is the critical distance over which the droplets of the virus can spread. For this pandemic, South African authorities are hoping for the best case scenario, that the country's Ow. lockdown can bring it under control. Meanwhile, South Africa hospitals are preparing for the worst. Franco Puglisi for VOI News. Johannesburg. 
Amid South Africa's coronavirus lockdown, 69-year-old grocery seller Lucy Malimele, one of the country's millions of informal workers, says she is forced to break the current curfew in order to feed her family. David Doyle reports. Great-grandmother Lucy Malimele says she has to break the law to survive. She's sold fruit and vegetables from a stall since 1983, one of millions who work in South Africa's informal sector. But amid a 21-day lockdown, the army and police have been coming to close down stalls at Soweto's Cliptown Market. As the sole earner in a family of eight grandchildren and great-grandchildren, the 69-year-old says she's had no choice but to keep breaking curfew, even though her pool of customers has dried up. There is no business, meaning the business is dead unless I break the law like I currently am. As I got some produce, which is not allowed, but I still went to get it. Being here is not even allowed. In an economy already suffering recession, power shortages and high unemployment, South Africa has not promised massive fiscal stimulus to cushion the blow like some other nations. It has brought in some measures for small businesses, but not offered any support to the informal sector, which Statistics South Africa says accounts for 6 to 7 percent of GDP. The World Bank says out of all South Africans currently working, 25 to 30 percent operate in the informal economy. President Cyril Ramaphosa has said the government is urgently developing additional measures to provide relief for informal businesses. But he has not specified when measures would be announced. For workers like Mali Mele, that means waiting for the lockdown to end and hoping for a return to business as usual. That was David Doyle of Reuters reporting. Now, while admitting he wants to prioritize domestic needs, U.S. President Donald Trump denied placing a moratorium on overseas shipments of personal protective equipment, such as masks and gowns, to help other countries. Analysts want the U.S. to maintain its leading global role. White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara has the details. Precious cargo of gloves, gowns, and masks is unloaded at JFK Airport in New York, the U.S. state hardest hit by the coronavirus. The website Politico reported the Trump administration stopped outgoing eight shipments of personal protective equipment. Why would I stop that? Wouldn't that be terrible to stop it? Is the U.S. stopping shipment of our own stockpile through USAID to other countries? No, whatever we have, whatever we've committed to, we commit. But we also need a lot for ourselves, so we're very focused on that until we get over this. So obviously we're not going to be shipping too much. The U.S. is asking countries, including South Korea, for testing kits and medical equipment. America has received, either through purchase or donation, supplies from several countries. China sent us some stuff, which was terrific. Russia sent us a very, very large plane load of things, medical equipment, uh, which was very nice. United States health workers are in dire need of medical equipment, particularly ventilators and personal protective equipment, or PPE. Our institutions are looking to our supply chain to try to make sure that the incoming PPE over the next two months will be sufficient, and there are uncertainties and anxieties about that. While the U.S. focuses on its domestic needs, some analysts warn it cannot back away from its global leadership during this pandemic, particularly when China and Russia are eager to fill any void. There's lots of things that we can be doing to help developing countries right now. We can help them by making small amount investments in uh, public service announcements to make sure people are social distancing in developing countries, that they're washing their hands. There are things like supporting the uh, creation of factories or supporting uh, companies that are textile factories in Africa to make masks. Last week, the U.S. pledged additional foreign aid to battle COVID-19, providing an initial $274 million in emergency assistance to more than 60 at-risk countries. That is in addition to funding that has been provided to multilateral groups, including the World Health Organization. At Siwida Kuswara, BOA News. As the coronavirus spreads across Africa, many countries are responding aggressively to flatten the curve. Regional experts say a widespread pandemic could cripple the continent's fragile healthcare systems 
and be devastating economically. Africa 54's Paul Ndiho spoke to Dr. Amit Taka, the Nairobi-based chairperson of the Africa Healthcare Federation. Taka says that Africa needs a united approach in dealing with COVID-19. We've seen what developed countries are going through. And now that we have the virus in Africa with about over 5,700 cases, some countries have more than the others, I think everyone, government, private sector, civil society, development partners are all on the forefront and preparing to ensure that we flatten the curve. As you know, the ability of our health systems is even weaker than many of the countries that have faced um, high levels of uh, mortality. How much, uh, in terms of preparedness, uh, do you think our countries or African countries have, have done? I think they have uh, really tried to prepare as much as they can. You know, the conditions are different from country to country. You cannot really copy-paste what Italy does or Spain does or UK does in countries in Africa. Um, we should scale up our preparedness. But let's look at Kenya, for example, where I am. Our president and the Minister of Health uh, leading the government efforts are totally on the ball about what's happening of cor on Corona. The private sector has regrouped itself in an organized manner to provide the support it needs. And we know that it's only through the efforts of every citizen and every sector to make this coronavirus, uh, to battle this coronavirus. I've been home for the last uh, three weeks, uh, working from home. Uh, we can barely go out. I, I wonder how it's like on your end. Uh, there are measures being taken to try and prevent transmission. As you know, in Africa right now, we are focusing on the big three goals. The first goal is prevent transmission. The second goal is prevent death. And the third one is preventing social harm. All our activities are geared towards these three goals. The coordination is at its highest at the national level. And right now, everyone is facing down in their own countries, looking at strategies, collaboration and cooperation to keep the numbers down and flatten the curve, as they say. But I must also <clears throat> uh, let you know that Africa Union has also been working extremely hard to have a continental approach. The, the chairperson, uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, the president of South Africa, announced just a few days ago that a continental approach is absolutely vital on the fight of coronavirus. Uh, you spoke about uh, funding. The U.S. government mm -hmm. announced that uh, it's going to uh, maybe try to help some of uh, uh, the countries in Africa that are in a very dire situation. Some African countries have also received uh, funding from uh, different sources. Do you think this is really enough uh, to tackle the kind of challenge that uh, we're dealing with? We need the support now, not later. I understand that these calamities are affecting many countries around the world. But we need that support. And um, the funding is literally not enough. What do you think can be done, at least uh, to mitigate uh, uh, or not replicate what we are seeing here in the United States and in Europe? I agree. We have to scale it up. We have to have public messaging. Uh, we need to really convince people in Africa that this is real and uh, change their mindset about uh, coronavirus and its... Uh, um, its impact. Do you think that uh, some of the measures that have been put in place by some of the presidents on the continent to stop uh, the transmission that you're talking about are going to be effective? It's already working in some cases. I can tell you that when we stopped the import or we stopped the flights, we, we, we probably stopped a lot of imported cases. When we started teaching or showing everyone about hand washing and social distancing, I think we've made an impact. But it's not enough. Africa needs the support and Africa requires a united approach in dealing with COVID-19. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. 
Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24 seven on voaafrica.com still to come. The life and music of Malian artist Hamasan Kare who died recently. We'll be right back after this short break. Hi, hi, you just hi, hi, hi. Nina uka ni luka buseli, na chingwe uka pena ni maleria. You my own man. I don't wanna waste no time. I say, Oh, love, oh, love, my mama. You know, I'm wanting you. I say, Oh, love, oh, love, my mama. Can I be the one for you? Tell me, where did you come from? <laughs> Welcome back to Africa 54. In East Africa, the Somali government's ban on international flights to prevent the spread of the coronavirus is having a major impact on access to the addictive drug CUT. More than 10 million people worldwide use CUT, according to the Kenya Medical Research Institute. In Somalia, men gather in groups to chat and chew the leaves, a mild stimulant into the early hours. Kimathi Munjuri, the chairman of Kenya's largest CUT trade association, says Kenya exports about 50 tons of cuts to Somalia per day. So the flights make Kenyan growers a massive $250,000 a day. Cut is sold to Somalia, which is mostly too hot and dry to grow the water-intensive crop at $5 a kilo. Now Mogadishu's cut market is deserted, apart from boys playing football and soldiers comparing guns. Tens of thousands of fake messages about coronavirus are being sent across Nigeria via social media. Now tech giants are stepping in. Emma McCarthy reports. Warning, 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 reads an article claiming the Nigerian government was due to spray coronavirus chemicals from a jet. With no specified date, this false message instructed people to stay indoors and not leave their clothes and belongings outside. It's just one of the tens of thousands of fake messages sent across the country that play into fears as the coronavirus pandemic continues to grow. And now tech giants are stepping in. Adaora Ikenze, Facebook's head of public policy in West Africa, said some of the company's team of more than 30,000 people who monitor content globally were checking Nigerian posts and third-party fact-checkers monitor posts in the country's main languages. It is um, unfortunate that some people use our platform for negative activities, but we are working very hard. We have always made a commitment um, not to accept that sort of um, content on our platform, and we're working very hard to make sure that it stays off our platform. A partnership with the Nigeria Centre for Disease Control launched in February sees information approved by global health organisations sent to Facebook-owned WhatsApp users and NCDC posts prioritised on Facebook feeds. Elsewhere on the continent, some governments have introduced tough penalties. In Kenya, at least two men, including a popular blogger, have been arrested for publishing false information about the virus on Twitter, an offence punishable by up to 10 years in prison or a fine of 5 million Kenyan shillings. Neither has been charged. And in South Africa, sharing fake news about the virus could land you with a six-month jail sentence. Along with the global coronavirus pandemic, Nigeria is also battling a deadly Lassa fever outbreak that so far has killed at least 185 people. Doctors say the illness is an annual problem in Africa that deserves more attention. Ifyoke Tang reports from Jos, Nigeria. Lassa fever is a hemorrhagic fever caused by the Lassa virus. The virus spread by rats is found predominantly in West and East Africa. David Asile, a doctor and Lassa fever survivor, says he caught the illness working at his infectious disease unit, even though he wore his personal protective equipment. I was the first uh, case of uh, a health worker 
working inside the infectious control wards, having to call, get a Lassa fever. And um, immediately, I was stripped of my PPE and my uniform, and I was given that of a patient. The psychological trauma was there. The um, stigmatization in quotes was also there. The family fear was there. And it was a whole lot, um, which I had to really cope with. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control, NCDC, which manages disease outbreaks, says that in the first 12 weeks of 2020, it recorded more than 900 confirmed cases of Lassa fever. 176 people died across 27 states. Health experts say early detection is key to reducing Lassa fever casualties. Most of the patients, you know, when they present early, you know, the mortality is very small. But when they present late, the mortality is high. The mortality here was used to be up to like 40 to 60 percent. But uh, now with, you know, availability of testing kits now, we could easily be able to identify those patients early. The mortality has dropped to around 20 percent. According to the NCDC, 34 health workers have been infected by Lassa fever this year through direct contact with body fluid of patients. Health workers say the lack of protective clothing is a major challenge. Patients come in already um, uh, bleeding, uh, which they have gone down with the disease, but did not come to a health facility on time. So in the eagerness of the nurses to take care of these patients, uh, those kind of viruses can then attack their own immune system. Nigeria is also battling an outbreak of COVID-19, with three states already on lockdown to curb the spread of the virus. Medical experts say adequate attention should also be given to the ongoing Lassa fever outbreak. No awareness, people talking about coronavirus more than Lassa fever, but the truth is that Lassa fever is killing people at the moment. The Nigerian Center for Disease Control says 100,000 to 300,000 cases of Lassa fever and about 5,000 deaths are recorded across West Africa each year. There is currently no vaccine yet to prevent the spread of the Lassa virus. However, Nigerian authorities say research is underway to find a lasting solution to the annual scourge. If you're Etang, for VOA News, just Nigeria. And we have a sad story to report on our entertainment report today. Malian artist Alpha Usman, best known as Hamas Sankare, died on Sunday when a vehicle he was riding in was struck by an improvised explosive device over the weekend. He was returning to the capital, Bamako, from his home near Funke, where he had gone to vote. Music Time in Africa host Heather Maxwell has more on the life and music of Hamas Sankare. How would you describe... Um his contribution to Malian music. He's one of the most important people who is uncredited with developing the desert blues sounds and rhythms because he was the percussionist in the beginning with Ali Farka Touré. He had toured the world with uh, Ali Farka. He had been, you know, from Japan to New York to everywhere. And what kind of percussion sound is it specifically? Well, he's credited with taking, uh, playing the calabash. He understood that all of the inter instruments of a percussion section can be uh, created by the sound modifications of the calabash. So when like the heel of your hand hits the uh, thing, it's, that's the, the, the kick drum or the bass drums. If you're, if you're using the stick, that's the snare drums. And then he can he can slide it slide it, or or uh, you know make different sounds that are like rubbing your hands on it, or or somehow creating like a polyrhythmic kind of a thing. How has his uh, sudden death hit you on a personal level? It's very sad for me. It's very sad because he was a a, a really vital person. He was you know it's like I view it myself. I'm aging. I aspire to be as alive as he was. He was curious, he was outgoing, 
and he was uh, uh, welcoming to everybody. He was a really a great super guy. And it's a huge loss from that personal, personal point of view. Mm. Uh, that, and, and I think anybody who knew him would agree with that. And he had a great following among uh, uh, the younger musicians. He was a mentor to many people. There was the song uh, Daryl Wege. He's dancing on the side of, with a bunch of young dancers on the side of the riverbank. And it's a very tongue in cheek lyric. The lyric is like, oh, look at her. She's really dressed up. Watch out for her. She's going to be trouble. <laughs> so he goes through all these qualities and he's like, ooh, watch out. She'll be, she'll be trouble. He was really like disarmingly um, charming. Everybody is going to say that about him. I remember that too about him. I was always happy to see him, even though I've never really spent time talking with him in depth. I always felt so happy when I saw him. Ebe flefo kabini san jume. I think also, while it's tragic, I want to uh, say it's also heroic. And let's think of this as like, uh, what, a, what a great legend. This guy is now a legend. Look at the way he passed. Incredible. Leaving voting. Killed by a roadside bomb. What a hero's exit. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a great weekend. Oh,